Hi everyone. So today we're going to be looking at commercial photography. So let's get to it. All right. So commercial photography, what is it? So commercial photography is generally images created to sell a product or a service. Um, a combination of lighting equipment is usually used, and this can be stuff that's shot both on location and in a studio. Now for commercial photography, since we're creating images um, that are being used to sell something, it is essential to have either um, property releases, which means that if you have a recognizable building in your shot, you have to have a release from the owner to use the image and sell the image. The same for people, and that's what a model release is. Um, if you have someone that's recognizable in your image, you have to have their permission to use that image and sell that image to sell another product. Um, we're going to go a little bit more into this stuff later on in the semester, but this is just really important to know. Um, along with that, it's really important to have pro to um, provide licensing for the specific use. So if you shoot, let's say, um, food photos for a restaurant, how are they going to use them? Are they just going to be on their social media? Are they going to actually use them on their website? Are they going to print them out on a menu? All of these um, need different licensing so that they have permission to do this. And that also affects how you're going to get paid for this. So um, you can also be a freelance. So there's people who are freelance photographers who are hired for the day or for the project. There's also in-house photographers or work for hire photographers. And those people are actually employees of the company. Um, and that means when it comes to copyright that the company is actually because you are employed by them, that they own the copyright. The big difference is if you're freelance, you own the copyright. Again, we're going to be getting into this legal stuff a little bit more later in the semester. Um, for large budget photo shoots, there's often a big team that you're working with. Well, it could go from small to big. You might be working with um, makeup artists, hairstylists, um, clothing stylists, art directors, marketing directors, and along with all that, you might even have photo assistants, or this might be how you get into commercial photography, is getting a job as a photo assistant for a commercial photographer. And last but not least, this is a great type of work for people who are detail oriented. Lighting and all the little details in an image are so important when it comes to commercial photography. So if that sounds like you, you might want to think about going into this. So let's look at some specific genres um, or subsets of commercial photography. Now there's all kinds. We're just going to hit on a couple today. So let's start with something that we're all kind of familiar with. That's food photography. <laughs> so food photography, side light is really important for showing those textures. Um, capturing color accurately is really important. You don't want your um, cheese to look green or something like that. And some of the popular shots for this types are eye level, which means you are down low on and looking right at the food or overhead where you're looking over on top of the food. And something else that a lot of people don't know is that the food that people are actually photographing are not always edible um, because, you know, it takes time to set up a shot and everything. Things for, like example, ice cream would melt, especially if you're in a studio and you have hot lights hitting it. Um, it's going to melt before you even get a chance to get a good shot. So, for example, for ice cream, a lot of times things like colored lard <laughs> or mashed potatoes are used because they have a similar texture. All right, so let's look at a couple examples. Now, this first one is, you know, this is the classic issue, right? You go to um, a fast food restaurant and you see this image on the, um, on the board and you're like, wow, that looks tasty. But once you actually get it, it looks more like this. <laughs> so there are some issues with this type of photography is that it, sometimes people feel like it's misleading and we're actually going to watch a video about that in just a moment. 
Um, here's a classic overhead shot, like I was talking about. Um, ingredients are often used as elements in the photograph. So, you know, if you were sitting here eating this pizza, you wouldn't have all this stuff sitting around, but it makes for something that's a little bit more visually pleasing. Um, it leads our eyes around and adds a little bit more context to what is actually on the pizza. Um, we have photos like this where you where you show people now this is actually more lifestyle photography which we're going to talk about in a minute we have um, another overhead shot this is kind of a combination of overhead and lifestyle so even though it looks like maybe all these things were <clears throat> just placed there um, they weren't. A lot of thought and effort was put into what type of plates to use, the different colors, um, the placement of everything, large versus small, and where everything's going to go to be visually pleasing and have a nice composition. Um, another great example. And um, now all of these other examples were probably shot um, either well on location or studio and there was multiple lights being used coming in filling in the shadows and such but I do wanted to show you a couple examples shot in the moment with the light that is available to you so um, this photo is a photo I took um, and this was outdoors and we had a really nice cloudy day which created um, a nice soft light over the image. We have, you know, light bouncing around. This is a little bit more on the eye level, slightly above eye level. And to add to it a little bit, um, we were at a restaurant called McMinimins and they had this cool thing back here. So this wasn't just like they served me my food and I took the photo. I actually took a couple minutes to like set the scene up, move this box around, get some of the name in there, um, move the burger so it has the uh, a really nice side showing and all of this stuff spilling out. Um, here's another example and let me actually go to the next one real quick. So same thing, um, we went into this restaurant and I love their food and so um, I purposely asked for to sit at the bar and closest to this really large window. That window light is going to create this really nice soft light coming in. Um, I knew that it was going to be a little bit hard to balance the white because if you can see here, these little highlights in this glass, there were um, orangish lights, which is usually what you have indoors. But then we had this really nice light spilling in from the side, which is more of a bluish light coming in. So when I was processing this, when I was editing, I um, kind of had to find that fine balance between the two. Now for this shot, I also um, asked, <laughs> asked them to uh, move some stuff. I pulled, I, I wasn't even drinking this glass of wine. The person next to me was, I asked if I could borrow it real quick, <laughs> um, move these things around. Now, one thing that really bothers me about this shot that I didn't think about was this trash can back here. Um, and so, yeah, I totally should have asked them to move the trash can out of the way. Eh, oh well, uh, they were busy, no big deal. Um, and of course this little green thing bugs me too. But like I said, it was shot in the moment and it can be done. You just have to be paying attention to the light around you um, and getting those nice angles and then getting down low, getting closer to really get those textures of this um, delicious pastrami sandwich. All right, so let's take a quick look. Now uh, we're gonna watch this video uh, <laughs> about behind the scenes at a McDonald's shoot. Hi, I'm Hope Bagazi, Director of Marketing for McDonald's Canada. And I'm here with a question from Isabel M. from Toronto, Ontario. She asks, why does your food look different in the advertising than what's in the store? Okay, that classic conundrum, right? Why the heck does it look so different? So we're going to find out. I'm actually going to... Um, fast forward a little bit, she goes to an actual McDonald's, buys a burger, and then heads over to the food photo shoot. With our food stylist and our photographer, and we're going to compare what's different about the two. I've just bought this quarter pounder with cheese. It's as hot off the press as it can be. Good. So maybe we just put that in get a photo of it so we can use that uh, for comparison. Okay, so let's back up just a tad real quick and look at what's going on here so we have this um, large white table he's got a large overhead light coming in kind of from the back 
Um, we have all these different lights coming in from the sides as well. And what's down here, and we're going to talk about this type of equipment um, pretty soon here in a couple weeks. We have flags, which are bouncing little, little bits of light into specific areas of the image. So like I said, very detail oriented. Um, you take an image and you don't just snap and take a photo. You kind of play with the light and um, move things around so that the food item is lit beautifully. So we'll keep the camera, the lights and everything the same. It'll be a direct. Now real quick here again, so he is shooting what's called tethered, which means that as he's shooting, the camera is wired to his computer. And so if he's working with a marketing director, art director, whatever, they can see the photo on the screen right then and there and give input. This is also great for the photographer to make sure that, you know, like sometimes when we're just looking at the back of the screen, Maybe it looks uh, great back there, but once you get it on your computer screen, you realize it's out of focus or something. So um, this is a really great workflow for that. Another reason is the different angles. If your camera's set up on a tripod, which it probably is for this type of shoot, um, it might be in an awkward angle where it's hard for you to get over and actually look at the LCD screen clearly. Another reason to use something like this. Direct comparison of the right side of both burgers. Perfect. Okay. That makes total sense. What I'm going to do is introduce you now to Noah, who's our food stylist. Well, uh, that burger was made in about a minute or so. The process we go through on the average shoot takes several hours. And here, I think it's important to note that all the ingredients that Noah uses are the exact same ingredients that we use in the restaurant. So it's the exact same patties. It's the exact same ketchup and mustard and onions. And Okay, let's go back real quick. So yeah, it's the exact same stuff, but obviously they're cooking it differently. <laughs> and um, well, let's see, I wanted to pause on the pickles. So what they're doing here is they're picking out the best pickles. <laughs> so it's not just like whatever pickles are next for these photo shoots. They're actually looking for an ideal looking pickle. And this goes for almost pretty much every professional photo shoot that comes that has to do with food um, you're gonna have something like this going on where they're going through batches and batches um, I remember I was talking to a photographer once who was doing a photo shoot of strawberries and they went through crates and crates and crates of strawberries with the art director to find the perfect strawberry same ketchup and mustard and onions and the exact same buns. Almost ready for you, Neil. Hey, Neil. We want to be able to show the pickles and the condiments as we build. Right. In the store, they would naturally just line it up straight in, in right. line. We have to bring it back a little bit to reveal the fact that there's it comes with the pickles and the right. slivered onions. Because we're in a one-dimensional world mm -hmm. in the camera, everything's in the back in the picture. I don't know what's actually in it. Right. This way we can at least tell people, you have ketchup, you have mustard, you have two pieces of cheese, and you know what you're getting. Perfect onion selection. It's like you're a surgeon in there. It's because we've had to put things forward, the bun is sitting crooked. So he's just compensating. So if I'm just melting down the cheese with my palate knife, maybe I'll put mustard, ketchup, actually ketchup, mustard, ketchup. Ready? Yeah. Oh, That's beautiful. nice. This burger looks pretty good. Okay, so that just even those little considerations with color, right? So at first he said mustard, ketchup, mustard, but then what I'm thinking he thought was like, well, we already have so many um, orangey yellows happening with the little pops of cheese coming out everywhere. Let's add a little bit of reds instead to pull this in. All right, so um, let's move forward just a bit to the editing and do a little finessing of the product less amount of retouching that we do to something the less perfect it looks but actually it looks more appetizing and more convincing but just enhancing some color taking out some of the little accents that might happen in preparation which obviously doesn't show the product in its best possible light here you can definitely see that there's a size difference the box that our sandwiches come in. Keep the sandwiches warm, so it creates a bit of a steam effect, and it does make the bun contract a little bit. And then the main difference is the fact that we actually took all the ingredients that are normally hidden under the bun and we pulled them to the foreground so that you can see them. And those are the main... Okay, so, I mean, what do you guys think? 
<laughs> so we saw for a second there that he was retouching the bun, um, taking out the little cracks, um, probably moving some of the seeds so that, you know, everything looks like there's an even amount everywhere. Um, you know, they're saying, well, you know, we want to represent it the best way possible, but still, it's not what we actually get. So... I don't know. What do you guys think? You be the judge of this one, okay? <laughs> uh. All right, let's move on. Now I did add another optional video. This is an awesome video that really shows um, Rick Gale's photography, um, how he goes about photographing food, and also it talks. Uh, they talk to his food stylist a bit too. So that's a whole nother job on its own. So um, if you're really interested in how to make food look amazing in photos, that might be a job for you. I mean, things like, um, you know, if something looks glazy, they might not, you know, the, the juices that we, that we would normally see on it, instead they might use motor oil to give it that glaze. It's really a very interesting um, field to go into. But I've already, oh man, okay, I gotta get going on this. All right, so I, I love commercial photography, so I can talk about this stuff forever. Fashion photography is one of my faves. And one of the reasons is because you can be so creative with it. It's so close to fine art photography where you can really come up with these great concepts. And this is gonna be more in the place where, where you're um, doing like fantastic makeup and costuming. I mean, look at this image back here. Absolutely beautiful. <clears throat> Okay, so um, backgrounds can range from simple studio backgrounds to elaborate sets and locations. Heavy retouching is the norm, um, sometimes to the point where the model doesn't even look like the same person. Now there's a lot of back and forth on this because the question is, you know, if this isn't a recognizable person, like, you know, it's not maybe a big celebrity, is it really that big of a deal if you're editing someone to create your own creative vision? I don't know. Um, there's obviously been um, a backlash, I don't know if you guys realize this, from consumers wanting a more realistic or truthful approach. Um, because let's be honest, retouching like this creates unrealistic beauty standards. Why doesn't my skin look like that? Why do my pores show and their pores don't? Um, why does every time I take a photo I have hairs flying around and all the models always look nice and presented, right? Well, they don't. The thing is, is they've been retouched. Okay, so they've been, they're giving us this idea, this, you know, branding, this message of this perfect world. Um, and again, is it being deceitful or is it being creative? You know, there's a fine line, I think. So um, something else that's been happening, which I am so happy about, is that there's been a huge push for inclusive models. This means um, different races, different body types, different weights, um, and different abilities, okay? So it's it's been a really refreshing five years, I'd say, in the advertising world, at least for me, what I see, because I love seeing different people instead of just seeing the same cookie cutter people all the time. All right, so let's look at a couple of examples real quick. Um, now, these first two examples are actually from the 60s by some very famous photographers. So um, we can see that we're using a shutter speed for this. There's this movement happening. There's this, you know, this is supposed to be an advertisement for the clothing, but we're also getting this, well, what would you call it? Um, vibe, I guess, <laughs> from it all. Um, and I love it. You can still see this type of stuff being used today. And this, by the way, is Richard Avedon, if you're curious. Next, we also have um, Irving Penn, and again, using motion, using these shapes, um, a carefully crafted light. We have a very hard light happening here, creating these wonderful light and shadow shapes along with the clothing that's really uh, going along with the idea of the clothing. So beautiful work, right? Um, so this is um, on the location on New in New York City. This was a fashion shoot that um, Annie Lebovitz did with Lady Gaga. And they just went out to New York City and started walking around. And the, the shoot from this is fantastic. If you're a fan, I would definitely recommend looking it up. Another Annie Lebovitz um, 
where this is, you know, instead of being on location, this is a set that was built specifically for this. And I mean, look at all of these details happening all over the place. I mean, can you just imagine being someone working on this, being the set designer for this, sitting here trying to come up with the ideas, whose photos to put back here, all the little details, um, and then doing things like moving, you know, all of the, none of this is on accident. Everything is very purposefully done. Um, the movement of the dress coming around, um, her look of being trapped, very much the Alice in Wonderland vibes, right? Okay, and this is a great one uh, because you can see that shutter speed was really important for this. So the main photo sheet, you know, the model stood still in the center, um, but there was still a long exposure where they moved their arms, probably stopping at each point. And I'm going to guess that this is actually, and it's kind of hard to tell, I think it's a composite image, maybe with the long exposure in the background. And yeah, definitely now that I'm looking closer because we can see the silhouette of her face. So the background image was probably had her face moving this way. Um, and then they added a still image of her on top. Super fun way to use shutter speed. Um, lovely colors moving us all around the image. Lines, leading lines, right? All moving us in and around this look and another composite image. And when I say composite, I mean multiple images put together to create one. Um, so this beautiful smoke bomb effect and then blended together with this great dress. They're also using complementary colors of orange and this teal blue. Okay, and a couple examples of the inclusiveness. Yay! So here we have, um, you know, someone with prosthetics someone in a wheelchair, uh, people of color. Like finally this is happening. I'm so excited for this trend right now. And one more, we have people with different types of skin, um, with different abilities and you know, it's just beautiful, right? I love inclusiveness. All right. So let's, oh, so many great videos. So little time. Okay. Um, yeah, let's just watch this. I'll fast forward parts of it. So this is um, part of a shoot from Neiman Marcus from 2016, but still great, great video. And this is, we're really going to start seeing um, how wonderfully or how many people are really involved in a shoot like this. So let me take this back up. Then seeing lots of beautiful inspirations, and I just thought, what if you could do all of this? So the person you're seeing there, they actually hired choreographers to help with the photo shoot um, and help them she come up. Set and she does what you do. Um, come up with ideas of how to pose with these different garments and such. So, uh, you know, this is someone that's not even a photographer or anything. Having a choreographer on set was a great experience, actually. And they brought so much to the table. What you're really trying to capture is a moment. But it's like any art form. I think once you learn the rules, then it's how can you break them? specific outfits that they've put together, the garments, these beautiful dresses, each one has a movement quality to it. Okay, and once again, so they have these sets that have been created for this, these shoots, as well as using um, just a, a regular photo studio as well. And you can see that we have all of these different lights. There's light stands here. Um, the black um, pieces of fabric are actually used to take light away. So, so there's non-reflective areas also. So if you want to darken an area, you add some black. 
Um, and as you're watching this, notice the different people involved too. It's not just the model and the photographer. There's the choreographers, there's the assistants helping with all the lighting and such. Whether it's hanging beads, whether it's this really light chiffon that can catch the air, it's all material that really moves well. I love to work on movement and I love humor and so we thought about lots of different ways of expressing this. Different dresses have different personalities and I think that that's kind of what Robbie and I have been trying to do with each shot to make them a little different. Something I'm realizing more and more, what really works is short little bursts. It's very much just little movements that look great on the camera. Okay, so I'm gonna leave this here for you guys. If you, want, you guys wanna come back and watch this entire video, I highly recommend it. It's such a fun, fun um, insight into a fashion shoot. <clears throat> now quickly let's take a look at retouching so this video um let's go ahead and start this now this video is someone doing a fashion retouch and they're going in so first off we have all of those little hairs okay those stray hairs that everyone has well you know for this they don't we're gonna make them all disappear and they're using photoshop for this um so let's go ahead and move forward. They go through all those little hairs and you can tell that this video is sped up. So a lot of time and work goes into retouching. Okay, let's move forward to another section. Let's see, I think this is where he's taught. All right, so now we're retouching the skin, um, smoothing skin, smoothing out, you know, all these little wrinkles. Okay, <laughs> you know, when people bend over or are hunched over in this way, they're gonna have wrinkles and flaps and stuff. It doesn't matter how thin you are. Um, but this is where those issues with body image really come in. Um, right there, you know, they're taking that out. And so you're expecting that if that was ever you, that that's what you would look like, right? But that's not the reality of the situation. And it's not just the people, they're also retouching the backgrounds, right? So they're taking out all the little cracks back there. And again, is it, you know, a creative thing because they want, they don't want people to focus on the cracks in the walls or whatever, the hair is flying around. They want them to focus on the, um, the image they're portraying on the clothing that they're selling. So I, ethically, how do we feel about this type of stuff? Okay, let's move forward all the way to the end and we can see the before and after. Um, oh, losing the liquify filter to um, bring her back in. And really it is a gorgeous image, right? But you can see those befores and afters right there. Yeah. So, how do we feel about this? I don't know. That might be something for the discussion. All right, moving forward. So much to go over. Um, next, we're going to talk about product photography. And by the way, this image was taken by um, our guest speaker for this week, Valerie Ramsey. Uh, she is an in-house photographer for this brand. Um, but that, that'll be the next video you guys are watching. All right, so product photography. Every product needs to be photographed <laughs> and it needs to be photographed well okay so um you know bad photos will actually turn off people from buying something so we can sit here and argue about whether it's you know ethical but um to retouch stuff but that's the truth of the matter if you see a photo of a product that's not good it's not going to make you want to buy it so Product photography is huge. Everything needs to be photographed and needs to be photographed well. Um, things can be really straight to the point. Like, you know, if you're on a website and you have the different t-shirts going by and you could see the exact t-shirt and what's going on. Um, or 
There's also um, times like this where maybe you don't have just the product on white by itself, but you have other things going on that help tell you more about the brand and what it's about. Okay, so um, careful control of light and shadows to emphasize textures and really show us what's going on. Also, um, <clears throat> like we saw in the food photography video, there's the use of white cards to add highlights and black cards to take away light and or, and or shadow or add shadow um, to images. Now for this photography, reflective surfaces are definitely the most difficult. Um, why? Because they reflect everything around you. So if you're not really careful with, um, with where you are, where everything else is in the scene, you might see the photographer, the camera, the stylist, or the studio, the whole studio reflected on a surface. So um, yeah, there's a lot of careful considerations. And that's one of the reasons I chose this image here uh, from Valerie's huge collection of work is because she's shooting on a mirror. She's shooting on a mirror. She has reflective surfaces here, but we are not seeing any of her props, her lighting, her, her camera, anything in here. So this is really masterful work. Um, along with this, I mean, just look at, you know, the colors. We have soothing colors um, against these warm colors. Really beautiful. Um, this great line, this curved line coming in. Uh, yeah, great image. Okay, so let's keep going. So next, let's go look at an actual retail website really quickly and look at some photos. So I'm just going to go to Target. And so everything on this website had to be photographed for the website. Okay, so um, we have, you know, different objects. So like, let's say, well, I was trying to make that larger. Dang it. Um, <laughs> so we have, you know, kids and such, um, you know, this reflective mask. It wasn't just thrown down on a table and taken a photo of. There was a lot of time that was taken to do this. And we have things like this where, you know, we're creating this, you know, scene so that the customer can have a feeling of what it's going to be like to actually have these in their homes. Right. So, um, yeah, next time you're shopping online, start paying attention to all the photos. What's going on? Why did they choose those photos? Um, oh, these ones are actually other people's photos. Hey, that's fun. I like that. Anyways, um, yeah, why did they choose the photos? Uh, can you see how they're being lit? Can you kind of have an idea, like, you know, with this candy wrapper, you know, candy bag, there's a slight reflection up here, um, this lighter area, I should say, the highlight that wasn't on accident, that was carefully placed. So why did they do that to add dimension to the bag? Um, so it doesn't just look like a flat nothing. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, really interesting to go in here and look at different products and really start picking apart what's going on and what they're doing here. All right, let's get back to the lecture. I could sit here and pick apart photos all day. Um, oh, these are some really great optional videos. Okay. So I have a Clinique styled photo shoot. And then this one's a really interesting one that both of these do a great job of showing you what the studio would look like when you're working. Let's take a moment and just watch a little bit of this. Let's see. Um, where was that part? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. All right. So, He's really taking the time to kind of like model and show you what's going on. And thanks to Minchin, we now have a zebra M flag. One of the toughest thing to shoot is a perfume that has got a transparent body and a reflective top like this. So the only way to nail. So right now, let's look at this. Um, just in regular light, um, you're seeing that we have all of these different lines here. Um, and that looks okay. But what he's doing with this card, so if you notice, there was a silver, black, and silver. So that's going to create that very Clinique look of having black area, silver, black area. The lighting is to light it from the back and at the same time have the reflection at the front taken care of. 
And the best way to light this up is to use a flash like this, my favorite Yongno. I like this because it's really cheap and, you know, for the price of... Use a flag. So what is happening now is that the flash is set at 1 over 8. Light up the flag. The flag lights up the Zebra M flag. And how, how do I know it's 1 over 8? Lightest chit chit. Yeah! Oh wow! Refer to our previous episode, you will realize that if your flash is set at 1 over 8 of a power, if you put it 2 feet... So that other stuff, alright, I know that you guys are going to love are really getting into this now. We actually have a whole class just on commercial photography. So I'm going to skip over this stuff. It's a little bit more advanced. Take the commercial photography class if this is interesting to you. And now I'm... Let's flash. see. Slightest ch Don't tell Sikonic. <laughs> so this flag now is going to be reflected off this Zebra M flag. And this part is black. This is going to be black as well because there's no light going through here. You're going to be hidden in the four stop shadow. And then the second flash is going to go under the product table. Now again, refer to your light. So this product table, which is something we actually have our studio at Fresno City College, this uh, sitting on top is a translucent piece of plastic. So it's white, but it's somewhat see-through so that you can light from underneath. So let's take a look. Make sure that your flash control is set to built-in flash, manual flash at the lowest power. So all my flashes now are running on slave remote, not CLS, not wireless, not whatever. Every time a flash goes off, it will just go off. So the first thing I'm going to do is to cover this a little bit so I don't get that sparkle. And... There we go. All right. So compared to that other shot where, um, you know, you didn't see there was all these different lines happening here. Now we have something that's a lot cleaner. Now I do see... I can somewhat see, still see a reflection in here. So he's doing a really great job. Now this might be something that they take care of in Photoshop afterwards. Um, but then also, you know, um, lighting the bottle. You, he talked about lighting it from below and the lighting it from the side and not just having that flash hitting it straight on, but that flash was actually hitting a white card and then bouncing back over. So yeah, very good very careful control of light and shadow when you're doing product photography. All right, so I'm gonna leave this there for you. Um, this is really interesting. Um, I absolutely love this video. It's a little bit longer, but um, he does a really great job of walking you through the process of setting up the lights and you know changing things accordingly to get what he wants from the image. Okay, let's move forward. Oh man, I'm taking up a lot of time here. Sorry, sorry. Let's. Let's go quicker. Okay, <laughs> lifestyle photography. So this is an image we saw earlier in the food photography section. Um, no matter the product, lifestyle photography is huge. And so lifestyle photography is really about showing people um, enjoying the product. And this helps tell the brand story, talk about the style of the, of the brand um, and what you can expect from, um, you know, buying the product. So in this case, you know, you're going to be happy when you eat their pizza. <laughs> you're going to have a great time with your friends when you eat their pizza. Um, now speaking of this pizza, is it just me or does this cheese look really, really yellow or something? Anyways. All right, let's move forward. Uh, <laughs> um, so I have some great behind the scenes videos here. Now, this one, you know, this is more of an on location shoot. So he has models acting as a family going out and this one's actually really short. So let's go ahead and watch this one. So you can see that they're using a big reflector here. So it's this big white fabric um, and it's really just being used to bounce light back into the shadows of everyone else, all the areas there. 
you can see that he's trying different angles. He's getting close. Um, you know, he's just trying to capture this idea of this family having a great time fishing. So this is probably for a brand that's, you know, maybe it's the fishing, the fishing poles or something. I don't know. Lots of fun stuff here. Really getting low here. Uh, love it. A really nice, quick insight. So you could do something, you know, simple like this. He just had like one assistant that was helping hold this up. Um, but these shoots can get super big. Okay. So here is actually a behind the scenes of American Airlines. Um, and let's see. Here's let's, a monitor. Let's go forward a bit. Okay. So for this, they're actually creating, um, doing a shoot, a couple different shoots. They're doing, um, I think there was one where it's like supposed to be in their lounge. And then there's another one where it's supposed to be, let me pause this real quick, um, of someone sitting on a plane. So first off, the light wasn't right coming through the window. They wanted this really sunny golden look. Um, and it was an overcast day outside. So they're using this light, this very high powered light with, um, this orange piece of plastic over it to create more of a sunny look. Um, and then it's on this really long boom arm here <laughs> to get it in the right position. Now we're also seeing just a moment. So right back here, let's see. Ah, missed it. So there's these curtains back here. Okay. Right here. And those are acting like giant reflectors as well. So reflectors are pieces of a fabric board that you bounce light back into. Um, and so these ones have a gold and silvery look to have more of a gold or silver, silvery look. Okay. And they're actually putting it all the way out the window to try to make, give it that look. So yeah, the day of the photo shoot comes and the light isn't right. Well, too bad. You still have to get the photo. Um, and look at this image. This is beautiful. It looks like a, a great sunny day. Um, so yeah, you, there's not, you can't use excuses when it comes to stuff like this because there's so much money being put into hiring all the people, the models, the assistants, the technicians, um, that you can't just say, Oh, it's just not working. We got to try tomorrow. You have to use the equipment you have to make it work. And again, they're tethering, you know, this much money spent on a shoot. You want to make sure the images are perfect. So you need to be tethering so that you can see them full screen. Okay. Let's move forward real quick to them building a piece of a plane. So those photo shoots of someone relaxing on a plane wasn't taken on a plane. Okay. There's not enough room for the lighting and for everything else to be happening to create the photo they want. So they actually build a set to do this instead. Pretty amazing stuff. some final images. So yeah, there's this image here. So, you know, we have the light coming in here. We have the light coming in through the window. Um, I'm not sure if they, if they place something back there to make it look like landscape or if they put that in later and post, um, they probably place something back there putting this much time and effort into it. Right. pretty amazing. So again, if you guys want to watch the full video, it is available here on my lecture page. Um, I find these behind the scenes videos fascinating because I don't think, you know, we really don't think about how much work actually goes into this stuff. 
Okay, last but not least, very quickly, I'm going to talk about stock photography. Now, stock photography, it really, you know, can be any of this type of photography. Um, really, what stock photography is, is where people can buy the licensing or um, to use an image for their own businesses. So they're in very high demand by graphic designers and marketing professionals. Um, some people would rather just use stock photography rather than hire a photographer. So this is something that you can do. Um, usually when it comes to stock sites, you do have to submit your work and they have to approve it before you can start posting it. You just can't start uploading stuff out of nowhere. You do have to get pre-approval. Um, a lot of stock companies also offer vector graphics and video clips. So vector graphics would be more like, think about like a logo um, or an icon, little icons. Um, that's more vector. And then video clips are huge right now too. Now, the thing is that at one point in time, you could definitely make a living on stock photography. Now, because so many people have, you know, access to um, cameras and such, um, which is a great thing, but that means that it's harder to make a living just on stock photography. <clears throat> a lot of people, excuse me, do, you know, do stock photography and something else. Um, but there are people that do it. Now the, those who do do it, put in a whole lot of time and effort into their stock photography. Um, they create a variety of high quality images. They upload thousands of images, not just, okay, I've got 20 great images. Here we go. You have to have a lot of images because you're only going to be making a percentage of the cell. We're going to go into that in a second. Um, and they have to stay up to date with the latest trends. So you have to be paying attention to what's going on. Um, and some stock sites will even send you prompts, uh, basically like, Hey, right now we need more, um, medical stock photos. So then you, you know, get a friend to dress up as a doctor <laughs> and find a doctor's office that'll let you shoot there and take some stock photos and such. Um, again, with all of this type of photography, photo releases are extremely important. If you don't have a photo release, you can get sued. You can be, or they could tell you, you just can't upload the photos. You have to also upload a photo release with the images. So, um, okay, let's take a look at pricing really quickly. So I have for two different companies, I have the pricing. So what their customers are paying, and then I have the payouts what the photographers are making. So let's take a look. All right. So first off, here's Shutterstock. This is a huge company. Um, and so you have a subscription for $29 a month. Um, you can download 10 images. All right. So that's not, you know, too bad, right? That's, but that's only what $2 and 90 cents per image. So how much is the photographer making? Okay. Let's take a look down here. So they have a tiered system where the more images that get licensed, the more you make as a photographer. So level one is up to a hundred number of image licenses this calendar year, you earn 15%. Okay. So, um, where's my calculator? Hold on. So if they were paying $2 and 90 cents per image now, I'm not sure exactly. Okay. Times 0.115 cents. That's 43 cents. So you took all this time, took a great photo. One person downloads it and you're going to get 43 cents. Okay. Up to a hundred. So once you get, you know, a hundred, so that's, you know, times 100. So now you have $43. Yay. Before you go to the next tier, which would be 20%. So you can, you can start to see how much you would really need to get right to, um, how many times your images would have to be downloaded for you to make a decent living off of this. Okay. So, let me try to do some math here. Um, <laughs> all right. So let's say you get up to level five. And so that means that for every single $2 and 90 cent image, um, 2.9 times 
So for each image, you're making a dollar and you want to make $2,000 a month. That means you need to be um, doing at least 2000. Well, that's not even the right tier right there. So let's hope for 2,500, um, <laughs> 2,501. And then you can make $2,500 that way. Yeah. So again, you got to sell a lot of images. Now, this isn't the only place. This is one of the biggest. We also have like Getty images. Now Getty, they have a lot higher standards. So, um, some of the smaller stock companies there, um, that are more geared towards like graphic designers and such, they, they're have, going to have smaller payouts, but they're cheaper also. Okay. So I'm running out of time here, so I'm not going to actually go into the Getty pricing. Um, but you know, if this is something that you're interested in, make sure you do your research, make sure you read through all the legal, uh, the legal fine print and everything, because you want to be able to see what you're actually going to have to do to make a decent amount of money. Now there's some photographers who just, you know, upload and then just, if they make anything great, but they don't stress too much on it. Totally up to you. Now, really quick, this is the last video of the day, um, for this lecture at least. And I want to show you now, this is a really interesting video because this photographer is basically, um, he does stock photography and he wanted to do a huge, um, a hundred person photo shoot. Now this means that he is having to, you can see they're all holding papers and filling stuff out. He has to get, um, releases for every single person, model releases for everyone that's going to be in the photo shoot. Another thing is they have to watch out for logos, um, logos, you know, if, if you're, if you want to sell a stock photo and someone happens to be wearing um, a t-shirt with a little tiny Nike swoosh on it, that's a no, no, can't do that because it's not a Nike, you know, you'd have to get a release from Nike to be able to do that. So he goes through and actually, um, has to check all of these things. Now I want to fast forward real quick. Now here's another part of the process. That's right here. We're going to watch here. We got a little mug shot action. There, look at there. Number 29 is just checked in. So he's doing this so he has a record of everyone um, and it's not only their their face but also with their their um, model release there so there's not a confusion about okay wait this is Mark who's Mark he has a photo with the release there as well um, so now we're going he's shooting in a movie theater so you think okay just put the screen on well that's not the case model lights into the theater screen the original plan was to shoot everything into the theater screen we weren't getting enough punch so we've actually brought in a couple octobox modifiers to shoot straight into the audience so we're doing that harley hit the button see what happens there we go it's going to be bright our whole thing is one big light source emulating what you would get with the movies um with the movie screen but come on down i'll show you a couple more things Okay, we're filling the audience up. We've got about 30 people so far. Everybody wave to the behind the scenes video. They're all quiet. Wave with noise. There we go. Okay, and back here, here's the prop Nazis. And you can't hardly see them. We, but look right here, they need lights. They're filling popcorn buckets, drink cups. Um, what else? We got some hot dogs, some nachos, and all that. They're putting all our all our drinks and popcorn so we can actually look like people are at this early morning eating junk food. So that's pretty much it. I'm gonna get back to work and um, go do take some pictures. So, so uh, yeah. So that, that's another part of the video is they had to do this while the theater wasn't during operating hours. So they had to come in super early in the morning. Um, but you could see that their hard work is paying off. Um, you can see he's on a ladder getting that shot. <laughs> this is what not to do at a movie pirating. Um, <laughs> how fun. Uh, and so if you've ever tried to take a selfie in a movie theater, you can kind of appreciate what's going on here because the photo never comes out great, right? But here he's out to actually, you know, make sure that the lighting is right and everything is good for this shot 
for this shoot. So anyways, if you really want to um, watch this whole video, again, it's available here for you. Um, <laughs> that's it for my intro to commercial photography lecture. Uh, there's so much to learn about it. I really encourage you, if this is interesting at all, to take our commercial photography class here on campus.